What is crackalating, everybody? Welcome on into the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast, powered by Number Fire. That is right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and numberfire.com. Today, we are getting you set for UFC 249 coming up this Saturday. A full slate of action for DFS coming your way. We're going to learn the ins and outs of the sports with Austin Swain. My name is Jim Sonis. I am a senior writer and analyst for numberfire.com. Joined here, as mentioned, by Austin Swain. You can find him on Twitter at aswain3. He does Number Fire's UFC DFS coverage, also does NASCAR and NBA. So, Austin, Kind of a, an interesting time for you. UFC kicking things off. NASCAR is a week after that. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm doing great, Jim. Uh, I I definitely am excited. I don't know why why I was picked so luckily that my niche sports happen to be coming back first from quarantine, but I'm excited about it. It'll be fun to get real life humans playing sports. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah, and it's going to be a wild stretch because UFC has a bunch of cards coming up right away, and then NASCAR has I think like seven races in 11 days. One of DFS for all those, but like you can bet on those, and like Absolutely. that's still pretty exciting. I'll take that happily. The problem that I have, Austin, is I know literally nothing about UFC. I am superbly squeamish. I cannot deal with any sort of blood. So I know nothing about this. So I'm sure. not going to give literally any advice. I'm going to lean on you, and I hope you're okay with that. Yeah, that's that's totally fine with me. You know, I've I've been hardcore into UFC for, for about five years now. So, you know, um, I, I think the sport, at first glance, if you're watching at a bar with some buddies, it looks like kind of barbaric. You know, people punch at each other. There's blood coming out. But there's actually a lot of science and actually a lot of statistics behind the fighters and how they're performing in there. Um, so a lot of fun to bet on and a lot of fun for fantasy as well. Statistics. Music to my ears. I can, <laughs> I can get behind this for sure. So we're talking UFC 249 here. We're going to go through the rosters on FanDuel, how scoring works. FanDuel is just recently offering UFC. It just started right before uh, the quarantine light, lit up. So uh, it is a new sport. We'll go through FanDuel scoring rules. We'll go through the roster slots, how scoring works, where you can find data, all that stuff. Lock is at 6.30 p.m. on Saturday night. But first, FanDuel Sportsbook is now available in Colorado. But what's a sportsbook with no sports? Well, it's FanDuel Anything Book, FanDuel's newest free game. Each day you will pick one free prop, like the weather, stocks, anything, and you pick it right, you win five bucks in site credit, then play again tomorrow. Play FanDuel Anything Book free only on FanDuel Sportsbook. Must be 21 plus. Max bonus is $50. Visit FanDuel.com slash audio for terms. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-522-4700. All right, so let's dive in here to UFC 249. Before we discuss the actual card for this weekend, I need to know the basics because I I know nothing about UFC, and I'm guessing a lot of you listening are getting into UFC in order to uh, really amp up your you know your DFS play once again. Maybe you've gotten sick of playing uh, League of Legends or, or Top Chef, whatever it may be. We've got over on FanDuel right now. So we're going to try to give an introduction to UFC while also sprinkling in thoughts on the slate. So Austin, I'm going to start things off here. Very basic. When you look at FanDuel, how does scoring work for UFC DFS? You know, that's that's a great question um, because there are a lot of different elements, but I think the first place that you'll want to always start when looking to pick who, who to roster for your fight is who's going to end up actually winning the fight. That's the important thing. That's what most people bet on. Um, and if you look at FanDuel's scoring breakdown, uh, say a guy's incredibly dominating in 15 seconds, he knocks out his opponent, he'll get 100 points for finishing his opponent in the first round. If, it, if the fight goes the entire distance because neither fighter can really gain that type of physical advantage, you only get 20 points if the fighter actually ends up winning and there's a variety of different bonuses in between. Um, but winning quickly is not the only thing that you're targeting when looking at a roster here uh, on FanDuel. Um, a fighter can be a valuable DFS play because of the stats that they can earn throughout the fight. Those are called significant strikes, which are any strikes at distance or hard ones that are on the mat or when they're clenched together. There's also takedowns, um, which are kind of like tackles of an opponent. If somebody's a wrestler, they may look to shoot for more of those. And you actually get points on FanDuel for if a takedown is denied. So good takedown defense also can earn you points as well. If somebody's into Brazilian jiu-jitsu or a different type of martial art like that, they get points for trying to choke or submit their opponent.
opponent as well, meaning they, they end up tapping. The, otherwise, they're going to end up with a broken limb um, or get choked out unconscious. So you get points for attempts at those as well. I think the best way to do it is if you look in real practice at the scoring system on FanDuel. The very last pay-per-view card back in May, UFC 248, Joanna Jacek, she was in the co-main event with uh, Weili Zhang. She scored 186 significant strikes but lost. She still got 112 points as a DFS play there. And then you take a look at the main event that followed right after. A couple of guys that were not nearly as active. Israel Adesanya won the title. He won the belt, but only landed 48 strikes. He only got 28 points in a decision win. So you can see the great disparity from somebody who actually lost their fight to how they, to someone who won their fight. And that makes a huge difference when choosing which fighter to roster. Right. Um, and it's, I mean, that's horrifying to hear. Like these, these <laughs> words like sound horrifying, like take down uh, like a, a significant strike. You get 0. Yeah. 0.6 points for, for a significant strike. Um, that's right. You get uh, five points for a submission attempt, six for a takedown and three for a takedown defense. So, a lot of different categories, but like you said, it does kind of revolve around winning. So mm -hmm. when you're doing research, are you looking at betting odds first? Or where do you go first trying to decide which fighters you want to roster? Yeah, absolutely. It, betting is the first place to start because despite the anom anomaly I just mentioned with Jacek and Adesanya in the last pay-per-view card, the conventional and positive expected value for a winning fighter is, is, is for a winning fighter. It's somebody who actually ends up winning their fight, whether it be a swift knockout um, or it could be somebody that's really beating on their opponent, building up those strikes, and then they win by decision. That's usually the conventional method to find a higher performing fighter. Um, if you take a look, the last three UFC pay-per-view cards, they all had exactly three first round knockouts and in the largest entry on DraftKings, which is another daily fantasy site that has had MMA for a little bit now, mm -hmm. the overall winner of the largest contest had all three of those fighters in their lineup. So I'm still okay. looking for first round knockouts. Uh, the strategy is still to find six winning fighters and build off of that. Hopefully my MVP would have the most points. We'll get into that later. Um, the only potential argument I would see for starting somebody who believe you would lose would be expected volume. Uh, based on the particular style of fight, or if you're expecting a five-round fight for a championship fight, there's more rounds, that's more points, that's more strikes available to you. So really, you would be looking at those rare situations, but overall, I'm looking for winners, man. So I, that, I am looking for those. One thing that you mentioned there that is interesting for me, again, knowing nothing about UFC, is that some matches are different lengths, and that can give you the potential for additional volume. Obviously, it may not break that way if the, the fight ends before that, but which matches on this card are scheduled to be longer. I don't know if I'm phrasing that right, but no, again, yeah, assume I know nothing here. You're exactly right, and so just some basics, and this will be explained uh, before the pay-per-view as well if you're going to watch on Saturday night, is the basics are is that mo most fights inside the octagon, they're three rounds long. Any title fights, so it's a belt potentially exchanging hands in a given weight class, or the final event of the night, if there are no title fights, those are all five-round fights. So the two okay. we have on tap on Saturday that'll be five-round fights will be Henry Cejudo and Dominic Cruz. They're fighting for the bantamweight championship that's at 135 pounds in the men's division um as well as uh justin gaethje and tony ferguson are fighting for an interim lightweight championship that's the main event that's also five rounds so those two fights are five rounds for those four fighters in the player pool so how much of a bump do you give to those bouts given that they are longer ones is that worth altering the way you view the fighters within those just because there's potential to go longer or does it not matter as much given that there are decent odds it doesn't even get there to begin with um hey i it, you're right in that it comes down to the particular style of the fight you know i think a great these two are a great dichotomy of that in that you look at justin gaethje and tony ferguson they go in their violence violence in mind i'm not expecting a five round fight so it I may very well get less than the three rounds i would get in a normally scheduled fight and then i look at henry cejudo and dominic cruz they're a lighter weight class so they're smaller they're smaller guys so they don't have the same type of knockout power it may be more strategic and it may end up seeing a judge's decision i might target volume in that fight expecting a longer fight um and, and many sports books break break odds down by how the fight's going to finish so you can see there's prop bets on how many rounds it's going to last what the type of finish is going to be and by whom so you can use that to kind of get a sense if you're not familiar with the fighters and their styles 
kind of what the what Vegas is expecting as far as what a fight is going to look like stylistically. Yeah, in general, leaning on sports books, if you don't know what you're talking about, probably a pretty good route exactly. for sure. And FanDuel Sportsbook specifically does have uh, outcomes as well, in addition to who will win and the money line there. Now, I think one thing that's interesting here, Austin, that you alluded to before was all the different scoring categories and how those may be dependent on the fighter. Where can we get that data? Like, where can we see how many significant strikes a fighter gets in a in a typical match and stuff like that? Where can we find data on UFC? Well, it's it's very very nice in that uh, about a year ago the UFC released their own internal stats portal at ufcstats.com. It has most of the necessary stats you need to see as far as predicting an offensive output from a fighter. Um, yeah, you can deep dive a particular fight. So if you're looking how somebody did in their last matchup or against a similar style fighter, um, you can look at the striking accuracy. You can look at striking averages per minute. It can break it down by whether it was to the head or the midsection or if somebody was targeting the legs. Um, any grappling and scrambling metrics will be there as well. Uh, and as well as it breaks it down by rounds. So you can say, okay, maybe uh, you have a gentleman who's a fighter that he's a strong starter. He comes out of the gate throwing a lot of punches and kind of tires himself out or somebody who kind of lets it build over the course of the fight and gets stronger as they go on i think of a guy like john jones that many people know of he's he's the type of fighter that will get stronger as the fight goes on by conserving energy so you can see um I think a great way you can also do it is look by fighter. So if you have a fighter that's on the card, like for UFC 249, you visit, say, Justin Gaethje's stat page in the main event. You'll see he's never attempted a takedown in the UFC, so, which is crazy. He was an All-American wrestler at Arizona State. But you can see when you see that 0 0.00 in his takedown per minute average, he's not trying to wrestle. He's not trying to take things to the mat. Justin Gaethje's trying to throw punches from the feet at distance and knock somebody out cold. Um, and so you can kind of begin to stylistically see what a fighter really specializes in uh by visiting their fighter page as well so all that all that data encompassed at ufcstats.com i use it primarily for my research and uh and i think they have just about every metric i could ask for and i think that they do have all the the scoring categories on fanduel those are all listed on ufcstats.com and i think the good thing is for someone like me who may not know the different fighting styles it's helpful to see how much they how how often they do these various things because I know nothing about these fighting styles but Definitely. Austin is you're you're someone who does watch USC and you do know what these fighting styles are like what kind of fighters you know are are there fighters who can rack up a lot of fantasy points in a hurry because of their style is there a particular fighting style we should prioritize when looking for that how does that break down. Yeah, the, there certainly are uh, a different breeds of fighters, you know, the, about three or four different general categories, I would say, in that you have fighters who are typically like Gaethje, they're trying to stand at range, they're trying to knock people out, they're more of a boxing type, I think if Conor McGregor's a guy who's very popular, uh, Conor McGregor's a boxer, that's why he got into a match with Floyd Mayweather, he really prefers to stand on his feet, um, you think of a guy like Khabib Nurmagomedov, he's a wrestler, so he's primarily trying to use his punches to set up opportunities to wrestle, and get to the ground to the Matt because he has strong arms and a strong core muscles that can really keep people down um, as well as you have submission uh, artists I think of a guy like uh, Crone Gracie or or maybe Charles Oliveira in his earlier days where really they're just trying to grab a hold of you so they can grab your arm and get it into a position called a submission attempt where uh, it could potentially be broken unless the other fighter taps out and, and says uh, okay you win um, so th those are really the three dichotomies of styles there's a lot of different ones um, that you can see pop up in particular styles like some people like to use leg kicks as a kickboxer um, but really that's what you're mostly looking at to target matchups is does somebody like standing do they prefer wrestling are they really not trying to throw any punches or wrestle at all they're just trying to grab a hold of your body part and get you to submit so uh, there's those are really the three that i would say are the big dichotomy uh tri trio right. tri -cod trichotomy whatever it might be <laughs> <laughs> I think that works. Tripod. Sure. You know, we'll, we'll go whichever way we want to go here. I think that what's helped me, again, you know, someone going in totally new to this, is having everything sorted out by the fighter and like showing you know, their submission attempts uh, and, and things like that, their significant strikes, and just showing it all together so you can compare different fighters and see how they match with other, other fighters on this card because I think that's kind of the context we're looking for here. So cool. that's been helpful for me, again, knowing nothing about this style and UFC stats – you do have to account for scale because some of them are per 15 minutes and some are per minute. So make sure you are accounting for that if you're putting it all in one sheet and try to calculate 
FanDuel points per minute and stuff like that. Uh, but it is a pretty major crutch there. Let's go back to the win discussion, Austin, because, you know, you look at the salaries here for the slate and it's almost exactly based on their money line odds to win in descending order. So that makes it tough. Um, are there any fighters who you think may be undervalued by the betting market who have a legitimate shot to win? Any underdogs out there who you think are pretty good DFS plays because they may be underpriced? Uh, yeah, certainly. Um, you, you know, there there are. That's the beauty of mixed martial arts is that you know that matchmaking is getting better with UFC. So sure. underdogs have a legitimate chance to win, I'd say more so now than any other time in the sport. You take a look back to 2018, which is a couple years ago, but that's when they finally have the dust settled with every UFC sanctioned event around the world. 33.9% of the time, the underdog actually won the fight, the the listed vague. So th- you can be assured in, in this 12-card fight, about three or four underdogs are probably going to end up winning. Um, when you take a look at underdog under uh, underdogs I like, I've already talked about the two fights when mentioned they were title fights, but you take a look at Justin Gaethje. He's a guy, he's got incredible power. He knocked out Donald Cerrone. Um, he's a plus 150 underdog against Tony Ferguson in the main event. Um, he's, he's gotten a first-round knockout in his last three events, so you're looking at the fantasy potential there. But also uh, his two losses that came before that were guys who actually ended up winning championships as well. Ferguson, everyone believes, is of that caliber, one of the best fighters in the world, but hasn't been a champion yet. So it's it's been a high level of competition. I think something that's important that maybe factors into MMA other than uh, than other fantasy sports is the fact that these guys are actually cutting 15 to 20 pounds of weight right before the fight to get down to their weight class. Tony Ferguson, a guy with a reputation is kind of crazy. He went through with his entire weight cut last you know, when he was fighting for April 18th and he got on the scale at 145 pounds. Not the smartest thing probably physically to dehydrate yourself and then again have to do it to cut down to weight again here three weeks later. Um, but that's just pretty typical Tony Ferguson fashion. But he could be physically hampered because of that. And so a guy like Geishu hits that hard. Um, it's something I'm definitely concerned about for Ferguson as a favorite. So I like Geishu there. Um, as well as the code main event as well. Uh, Dominic Cruz, is, is, he's only $12 on FanDuel and he's a plus 200 underdog right now. Um, he's one of the best ever to fight at 135 five pounds, but it's been three years since Dominic Cruz fought. He's fought off a variety of injuries. He's a voice familiar to MMA fans because he does a lot of broadcasting for them as well. Um, He got this title fight three years out of retirement for a reason, and that's because Cruz is one of the best to ever do it. He'll fight Henry Cejudo, who's only five feet four tall. He's a very small guy. He usually fights at 125 pounds, uh, but Cru- but he's moving up to 135 where he actually has the belt. He stepped in as an interim there. Um, Cruz, I, in my opinion, I think Cruz should be favored in this bout, but we just don't have any we don't have any tape on him. And so because it's been three years, we have no idea what he's going to come out of retirement looking at. But he's a much bigger fighter. He's not afraid to wrestle in Cejudo. That was his claim to fame as he he was a gold medalist as an Olympian, as a wrestler. He, he can wrestle with Cejudo, and he's actually larger, which will make it harder for Cejudo to gain top control on him. Uh, striking, it, it, striking Cruz's, the numbers are far, by far in Cruz's favor. Um, Cruz is at around three and a half strikes significant strikes per minute um as well as it's against better competition you know tj dillashaw two-time champion of the world cody garbrandt uh was the one who beat dominic cruz but a lot of great strikers that cruz is used to facing and cejudo's just not really been on that level take a look at cejudo's last two fights mighty mouse johnson not even in the ufc anymore they traded him away imagine imagine getting traded out of the nfl that was (laughs) demetrius johnson he was traded out of the uh, ufc for ben Askren, who has since flamed out uh and marlon marias has looked pretty pretty terrible in his last couple of fights and that he had the lead on Cejudo and ended up getting knocked out and then you take a look after that um, he lost to Jose Aldo on, on, an out, on a weight cut that Aldo was looking like he was about to pass out at weigh-ins from how bad the weight cut was Aldo almost ended up beating him so the competition level questionable for Cejudo as the champion so I really like Dominic Cruz in this fight overall I, you know like it's anytime you say I think this underdog probably should be favored in my personal opinion that's a guy you're looking to target for a FanDuel roster yeah, Dominic Cruz, uh, plus 180 and just $12 on FanDuel. Uh, Justin Gaethje is $15 and plus 150. So interesting names to consider there. And Gaethje's uh, significant strike numbers popping. They're yep. popping on the spreadsheet. Again, I know nothing about this, but hey, I know to work a spreadsheet. He's <laughs> looking pretty good there. Um, let's talk one more thing, one more question here about winning, because I think that is kind of the, the crux of building a lineup. And I think that it can be difficult on FanDuel where you have – 
the salary set essentially by the win odds. Does that make you strive to be a bit more balanced with your lineup? Or do you feel confident enough in your ability to find underdogs who can win where you're okay going a little bit top heavy, maybe getting up to some of those higher priced fighters? Yeah, um, you know, especially in cash or lo- or lower stakes tournaments, uh, I'm definitely looking at the caliber of the stud that I have when targeting value plays. You know, um, if I have a stud that I can trust, you take for example somebody like Valentina Shevchenko. Nobody's run around against her in a year, uh, and she's only lost to one woman in the UFC. Um, she's gotten at least two takedowns in four of her last six fights. She has a pretty high floor about her scoring output, and I know those two fights with Amanda Nunes that she lost actually. She still went the distance and she still scored some points. I have a very high floor with a, uh, somebody with Shevchenko. I have a high body of work. I've seen her fight before. I would really target stacking her in a spot that I like her in because I know what type of output I'm getting. I think I go back um, to a moment that may have scarred, certainly scarred me as an MMA better and, and, and daily fantasy players at UFC 241. Gentleman by the name of Devontae Smith was a minus 750 favorite. Sounded like from all sources and experts, it's a shoe in that he's going to end up winning. He got knocked out cold in the first round by his opponent, comma, worthy as a minus 750 favorite. Um, and, and he had a huge significant strikes per minute marker 6.88 like you said it was popping off the charts but he only had two fights in the UFC at that point and the, and the sample size of just a few minutes of fight time wasn't large enough for for us to really get an idea of how he's how he was going to match up stylistically so finding value plays is always going to be in an ex, in exact science because if you're brand new to MMA DFS I can't wait for the first time you experience where your fight fighter statistically should have won the fight on the judges <laughs> scorecards and then it goes the other way and so uh. you don't end up getting the win bonus on the decision so um, it's always in an exact science. So I'm always building around my confidence of studs and starting there. And then I sprinkle in my value plays based on if I feel like it has a legitimate shot to score well. Yeah. And then furthermore is the winning odds of the underdog as well. And I think that based on the way you've talked about this slate specifically, it sounds like we'll have options in the cheaper end where we may be able to go a little bit top heavy here too. And hopefully that's not the same Devonte Smith who is playing for the Tampa Bay Vipers and the Michigan Wolverines. We'll, <laughs> it's not. we'll hope it's a different dude. Uh, okay. So let's go back to FanDuel here where we have an MVP bonus. And if you haven't been playing like, single match football or playing League of Legends, anything like that, you may not know what an MVP slot is. But on FanDuel, you get a 1.5x multiplier for the player, the fighter you put in that MVP slot. So let's say a fighter scores 30 FanDuel points, and I don't know if that's realistic or not, but let's say they score 30, that sounds a little low. Regardless, you multiply that by 1.5x, they would get 45, and the salary to use a player in your MVP slot is the exact same as if you want to use them in any other slot. So essentially what you're doing is you're picking the highest scoring fighter on the entire slate. Austin, for you, who stands out as being an option for that MVP slot? Well, you know, it's it's not incredibly sexy if you're doing sim- single game uh, NFL and you pick a guy like Lamar Jackson or Patrick Mahomes, the most I'll expensive. I'll pick Lamar player. every time. Answer, <laughs> yeah, absolutely, the most expensive player in the player pool. They usually have a pretty high floor as well as combining that with a good ceiling as well. And and I, I know it's going to be somewhat interesting to do the same here. But uh, the first guy that comes to mind is the most expensive player in the in the player pool. It's Ryan Span. He's facing Sam Alvey. Uh, Ryan Span's twenty two dollars on Fanduel, which is the highest price of any fighter in the pool. But I think he might be worth it um it's the first fight of the card at 205 pounds so right when it locks at 630 these guys will be walking out for their fight um span he's a big athletic striker he's won his first five mma events um he's not he's not really a ground he doesn't really have any ground game that's been tested he eked out a win um over luis henrique doing that uh and he likes to try to he likes to try to knock opponents to the ground using his fists and then look for submissions to finish that's a good way of changing things up in case uh your opponent thinks you're hunting your uh, one knockout potential. He's undefeated in UFC, and he takes on a very, very well-known veteran of the sports, smiling Sam Alvey. Not incredibly, uh, not not incredibly um, technical, not incredibly athletic, but he's just as tough as a two-dollar steak. Uh, you know, he's gotten by on grit and, and just very savvy, um, knowing when to shoot and when to strike. But now he's aging as a veteran. Um, I have my qualms with Span as a prospect. He's pretty untested in the UFC, but all these aging and if you take a look at less than his uh, takedown uh, takedown attempts per minute, it's in the point three area. He's not really ever trying to get the ground, get the fight to the ground, get on the mat, rest 
wrestle, do anything like that. He's really just going to stand up and strike. And unfortunately for him in this matchup, he's facing Ryan Spann, who's he's bigger, he's taller, he's he's more athletic at this point in this career because of his age and things related to that. It really, a good wrestler one day is going to knock Span off his game and probably derail his hype train a little bit. But Alvi's not really built with that sort of toolkit. The thing that the thing that I would be afraid of for Alvi is that he does have that toughness. And if if Span ends up not knocking him out in the first round, I'm worried for Alvi that this might pile up significant strikes. Uh, against him as he continues to keep fighting through just to make it to the end of the decision. But Span should have no problem keeping his distance at the feet, mixing in his combinations, um, and should greatly improve on, if you look at him statistically, he's only got 3.26 significant strikes per minute. So you say, I feel nervous about paying $22 for a guy like that. Because the fight, you can you can tell what the style is going to be. You look at Span's last few fights; he's got a couple of quick knockouts in there, as well as a wrestling match. So he hasn't really been able to do what he wants to do, which is strike at distance, and all the will let him do that. Okay, so Ryan Span, twenty-two dollars on FanDuel. He is minus four forty on the money line. Nobody else is shorter than minus three thirty. So a pretty major gap between Ryan Span and the field. So, like you said, sometimes the most expensive fighter is the most expensive fighter for a reason. Any other higher salaried fighters you are considering for this card? Yeah, I, I love Francis Ngannou at $20. Uh, I think he's the best play on the entire slate. Uh, very similar reason why I love Ryan Spann. It's because I can predict the fight stylistically. Um, you know, he and Jair Rosenstrike, neither of them are wrestlers or submission artists. In fact, uh, MMA fans will re- remember Francis Ngannou's vol- uh, fight against Derek Lewis. Um, only 31 total strikes in the fight. And Ngannou only had 11 of them, mostly because it was just a wrestling match with no punches being thrown. Uh, fans were booing at the end of the fight because there was no action daring it. That's not the case, which you're going to get with Rosenstrike and Nganu. They're both going to stand at distance. Um, you know, the, Unfortunately, there is a little bit of a drawback in the, this fight when, when they're standing toe-to-toe. They're not going to throw a lot of punches, but one, whichever one connects with a face is going to be very, very hard. These are two large men, both sitting um, upwards of six foot three and over 245 pounds. They're big guys uh, and typically at heavyweight like these guys are fighting at. One punch is usually all it takes. And Nganu, the reason he's a minus 280 favorite on the board if you look at them statistically, Rosenstrike actually has more significant strikes per minute. It's against much lesser competition. And Ghani's fought guys like Stipe Miocic uh, and Alistair, uh, and um, they both fought Alistair Overeem, but Derek Lewis as well. He's fought guys that have fought for the belt. Rosenstrike took five full rounds to dispense of Alistair Overeem uh, a couple years after Nganu fight him. Nganu took about five seconds or closer to that. Okay, so uh, Nganu certainly with the common opponent there did much, much better against Alistair Overeem. I think it's a level of competition gap where Rosenstrike probably took this fight because it's good money to fight Francis Nganu. He's a very popular guy, very a lot of fun to watch because he, his nickname's The Predator and he looks just absolutely jacked out there. So, um, you know, it's a good money fight for him, but I don't like his on stand actually end up winning it. Uh, Vicente Luque is another guy that I target. He, uh, he He's $18 on FanDuel. He just got a striking class uh, in his last fight from Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, who's one of the best 170-pound strikers to do it. Takes a giant step back in competition and not only fight IQ on Saturday, he's f- facing Nico, the hybrid price. Price is a UFC fan favorite. He's he's typical. He's a typical warrior. You know, I'm going in there. I, I'm ready to die if I have to, and he's just going to throw punches. He's he's knocked guys out from his back. He's knocked them out with uh, kicks upward from his uh, from his feet. You know, he's just a crazy circus kind of fighter. But he doesn't have a very high fight IQ. So Luque's a uh, Brazilian. He's very uh, he's very technical. Trains with trains with one of the top camps down in Brazil. Um, He's an incredibly smart fighter, and you take a, when Nico Price fought a guy like Luke last, he got knocked out by Jeff Neal. Uh, Luke will pile up, pile up the significant strikes too. 163 of them when he when he brutalized Brian Barbarena, if, and he actually knocked him out and finished that before it went to decision. And he broke platinum Mike Perry's nose, and, and Perry really hasn't been the same since he landed 84 strikes in that fight. So Luke is a guy who has a good combination of power and volume. He's taking on a guy that doesn't always put himself in the best position. Uh, I think worst case scenario, Luke is probably going to point his way to a decision just by knowing how to accumulate those points a little better. Uh, but if Price isn't careful, Luke can really, really pack a punch as well. So I think you have a good uh, good shot at a knockout there with Luke too. Uh, Vicente Luque is $18, minus 270 on the money line, which is shorter than most fighters in that range. Uh, so that definitely makes him intriguing from that perspective. I want to go back to Francis Ngannou. It sounded like Based on the weight level here, you're expecting potential the potential for a short match. Does Absolutely. that 
incentivize you to consider Nganu at the MVP slot if you're trying to pivot off of Span, or does the the lack of striking and the lack of lack of potential volume lower the upside of Nganu? What's the kind of balance there? Oh well, absolutely. I I think that well, I mean, I I don't think that it lowers the volume because okay. certainly you you know you're looking at the length of the fight being short for either way. I'll have exposure to both sides of this matchup in tournaments, okay. by the way, because Rosen Strike he's a big guy too. You know he could get and then all of a sudden you differentiate yourself uh, with Rosen Strike uh, as well in some lineups. Probably not in an MVP slot, but uh, th- I would go to Ngannou at MVP. I have a longer track history on him than I do Span, so I'm a little bit less nervous about uh, any sort of unforeseen seen complications or anything like that. I, I know what product I'm getting from Nganu at that point. Uh, certainly, I think he's worth considering pivoting off of as well. Um, the one place I would not pivot off of is to Calvin Cater. Uh, I think Cater is $19 on FanDuel. Correct me if I have that wrong. He's 18, wrong. yeah. So he's right eight, yeah, yep. he's 18. So it, the, uh, Calvin Cater, um, I, he, he's a tremendously technical fighter probably looking at a decision win there. Okay. Um, and so because Cater, because Cater's never really trying to knock you out, he's trying, he's a very technical striker, like tries to outpoint his opponents. Sometimes in the process of brutalizing them, they do get knocked out, but he's really mostly trying to point and win decisions. That's a place I wouldn't go, but any type of knockout potential is certainly something you could argue making a case for the MVP slot. That's really what you want. You either want a first round knockout in your MVP slot, or you want just some sort of brutalization that, uh, that encompasses over a hundred significant, Get strikes, a few takedown attempts where really the opponent was just largely outclassed. The problem is uh, this fight card, because of the long layoff, because of the quarantine stuff, the matchups are too good to really have that large of a disparity. Uh, you'll see you'll see odds as high as minus 1,000 on some cards, but you saw only largest favorite is Span at minus 440. So the fights are all pretty tight. You had mentioned Rosenstrike potentially getting exposure to the other side of the Ngannou match, and he's only $10 if you want to go that way on mm-hmm. FanDuel as well. Any mid-tier fighters who stand out to you potentially better than what their salaries would indicate? Well, uh, you take a look. If you're brand new to MMA, maybe you play NFL DFS, and that's why you happen to be lurking around FanDuel these parts. Yeah. Uh, draft just happened. You're looking for some sports stuff. You might remember former Panthers and, and Cowboys defensive end Greg Hardy. Woof. He was blackballed. Yeah, he was blackballed. Yeah, yeah, he was blackballed out of the NFL, some really uncomfortable hate behavior and some domestic abuse allegations. Baggage like that's unfortunately never scared Dana White. Uh, yeah. Dana White's a, a massive promoter. He's very much just like an old school classic boxing uh, boxing uh, promoter. And you take a, a, a guy like Hardy, he's very polarizing, and Hardy draws viewers to the television. That's why he's had a spot on pay-per-view cards despite being – relatively untested as an MMA fighter. Um, And the thing that's interesting about Hardy is that he's actually had a better MMA career than somebody probably would have expected. His last effort was actually his best. He lost to Alexander Volkov, but Alexander Volkov's a ranked heavyweight. He's number seven in the entire world. Um, And he stood toe-to-toe to him, and he definitely lost his fight. He lost the decision, uh, but he looked like he belonged in that fight. It didn't look like he was outclassed in any way. Um, He he toasted Juan Adams as well and was on his way to doing that to Ben Sassoli before an illegal knee disqualified Hardy from the fight. So, um, you know, he he takes on Jorgen DeCastro in this fight. I have all of two minutes of data on Jorgen DeCastro. He made his MMA debut last fight against Justin Taffa and knocked him out cold. Um, again, the, these guys are back at heavyweight, which is a really a fan favorite because you have the shorter potential there. You have bigger guys hitting harder. Um, Hardy, though, I have some data on, and he's an efficient striker, 4.77 significant strikes per minute, uh, as pronounced athletic advantages, a lot of that coming from you know being an NFL body fighting in MMA. Four inches of height he'll have on uh, on DeCastro. He'll have 15 pounds and at least six inches of reach at heavyweight. And I think he's going to be quicker too. Um, he's training with American Top Team, which is one of the top MMA gyms in the country. So you know he'll be even better than he was against Volkov. And if the guy that fought Volkov shows up to fight a prospect like Jurgen DeCastro, Greg Hardy's going to be in for a very successful evening. It's just uh, he, he they're not on the level of ranked heavyweights sure. yet. And so Hardy might be trending that direction though and so that's interesting for the former nfl player interesting uh anybody else in that range who you really like if i would rather lose money than use greg hardy um <laughs> you mentioned i guess like tony ferguson and justin gaethje are kind of in this range too are they the other guys who kind of stand out to you around here um, yeah, absolutely. I, I, I think also in this range, which are range, which you could be looking at is, uh, I, I'm certainly kind of targeting a, a kind of higher volume fight between Donald Cowboy Cerrone and Anthony Showtime Pettis. Um, you certainly because of the, 
potential lack of defense involved. Both, unfortunately, have had their ca- faces caved in. They're, they're long-time MMA stars, but the lack of defense makes for a potential large striking output. I'll have plenty of exposure to both sides of that matchup as well. Um, I think I think you look at a guy who's a slight favorite as well, kind of like Hardy is uh, uh, Jacare Souza. Uh, he's facing Uriah Hall in, in a matchup that I can't quite put my finger on stylistically in that um, Jacare is a – he's a – Brazilian kickboxer, so he mostly likes to work at range with his legs. And Uriah Hall, he picks a new style every time he's in the, in the octagon. It, um, it's uh, certainly plays to his level of competition in that he'll perform really well if he gets a higher ranked fight, fighter, and then he's lost had some bad losses over the course of his career. So if you don't, if you'd rather lose money than play Greg Hardy, those are a couple <laughs> you can kind of look at in that same type of balanced pricing tier. Yeah, Jakare Souza, uh, if you're looking for him on UFC stats, search under that name. On the FanDuel player pool, he's under Ronaldo, which yes. caused me a lot of confusion on Friday, but we figured that <laughs> out eventually. So right. we're, we're working on it. Uh, what about value plays? You talked before about like Dominic Cruz potentially fitting there. He's $12. Is he the main value option for you on this slate? Yeah, uh, certainly. Like like I said, uh, you know, if if I had a, and I'm not an odds maker for a very good reason, but if I had looked at this fight stylistically and I checked all the boxes about physical advantages, higher IQ, level of competition, really the only thing Dominic Cruz is missing is recent footage or form. Yeah. You know, if if we had a fight from six months ago and he looked even 90 percent of himself, he'd probably be a, a minus 250 favorite over a guy like Henry Cejudo that he's much bigger than. We just, I think the unknown there, the assumption is ring rust. He's going to be worse than the last time we saw him. But I keep going back to um, uh, when George St. Pierre came out of retirement to fight Michael Bisping. Michael Bisping liked guy, questionable level champ. You know, we weren't sure of his path to the belt. That's I get those same type of vibes with Cejudo. George St. Pierre came out of retirement. We were worried about the rust there. And he really quickly dispensed of Bisping because there were levels to the fighting game there. And I feel like something similar is going to happen with Dominic Cruz, where I really feel like he's the one to build around against Cejudo. Um, you have the five round floor there as well, since it's a longer fight with Cruz. So even if he ends up taken a tough decision you have the the baseline points there in cash or lower stakes tournaments um so i'm really building around Cruz primarily uh, a couple of underdog options to keep your eye on as well though um it's in a couple of prelim fights these won't be on the pay-per-view card they'll be before on espn plus uh michelle watterson the, her nickname the karate hottie uh, she's been floating around the women yeah great nickname right the uh, <laughs> She, she's been floating around the women's MMA title picture for a while now. Uh, incredibly well-rounded fighter. You take a look. Um, she's facing Carla Esparza. Carla Esparza, she's 5'2", uh, in, in, which is the um, – which is an incredibly tiny for a 125 pound fighter. Uh, she like usually likes, likes to wrestle, and Watterson's more of a striker at distance. You can see that with her 3.35 uh, strikes per minute. Esparza is only at 2.22, which is very, very low. Um, and so I, I feel like Watterson, with her physical advantages, she's a couple inches taller. She'll have probably a weight advantage realistically inside the octagon. They'll both weigh in at 115. Right. Watterson will probably be bigger when she rehydrates. Um, I feel like Esparza is going to have a tough time controlling her with her wrestling like she usually tries to do and the level of competition hasn't been close Watterson's been fighting uh, Joanna Jacek around the title picture Esparza just barely got by Alexa Grasso in her last fight which is which is lower end of the top 10 so I like the competition disparity there Watterson's actually an underdog she's only $13 on FanDuel um, the only reason why I'm not pulling the trigger on her the, like I would a guy like Cruz is I'm a little worried about the low scoring potential um, just uh, over time women's women's fights usually see, have less fantasy points and the reason why they're more technical they're but they're better quality mixed martial arts but it's not it's not quite the same fantasy points as a first round knockout or just a brutalization of the other dude um but so that's why i'm a little trepidatious but i really like watterson to win outright especially uh i think i think last check on the on the odds on friday she was about plus 135 i really like the outright bet on michelle watterson there and then I turn to a really strange fight that I hope it's not the first fight you turn in and see if you're uh, if you're an MMA fan because you might turn it right back off. It's going to be Alexei Olynyk, who's a, a 42-year-old Russian against Fabricio Verdum, 42-year-old Brazilian. 42, just as it is in the NFL or any other sport, incredibly aged. These guys have been around fighting for a long, long time. They're on the back nine of their careers. They both might be playing whole 18 together. Uh, <laughs> But uh, we're doing. He was knocked out cold last fight by Alex Volkov, Greg Hardy's last opponent as well. Olynyk actually beat a much lesser opponent in Maurice Green. 
I don't really know what physical condition I'm getting either fighter in at this point at 42 years old, but what I do know is that Olynyk has a style I can trust. He, his nickname's the Boa Constrictor because he actually throws punches to set himself up for opportunities to just simply get his hands on you. And as soon as he gets his hands on you, he, he's got an 80-inch reach for um, a 205-pound person, which is it, which is a gigantic – that's what you're looking at with an NFL defensive end. A pterodactyl. Exactly, yeah. And uh, and so what he's doing is is he really tries to get a submission attempt there. Um, and so I think that Verdum at 42 years old isn't going to have the athleticism to keep his hands off of him. And so you'll get a line. He's only $9 in the FanDuel player pool. But what I'm talking about is that if he can get his hands on him and somehow get a first round submission win, then all of a sudden you're looking at at least at least 107 FanDuel points out of $9. That's tremendous value if Olynyk everything goes according to plan. Problem is, in, in his last five fights, he has gotten that submission three times. He's also gotten his skull cracked in twice. Hmm. So it's kind of a, it, it's a two outcome fight here, but I like Olynyk's chances against the uh, athleticism ridden uh, Verdum in that fight as well. And this shows the value of pulling those stats from USCStats.com because that fighting style shows up in the stats. He's uh, He has the most submission attempts for 15 minutes of any fighter on the entire card. Uh, he is also second or third in takedowns for 15 minutes. So, like, that shows up in the stats. So it's kind of nice to have that crutch to lean on if you're like me and know nothing about the style of these fighters. Uh, Olinik, $9 plus 260 on the money line there. Anything else on this slate, Austin, we have not covered yet? I think we've gotten some quality options in each tier, but anything else you want to add here? Yeah, it, you know the card it, because of because of the long layoff, the card is loaded with absolutely great matchups. Uh, if you're a fight fan or or new to fighting, you're going to get a lot of different tastes of different styles. Um, the fight should be very close, which which is good. You don't want to you don't want a bunch of fights where it's kind of a non non competitive three round beating uh, down. You know, you take a look. We talked a little bit about a guy like John Ray Souza against Uriah Hall. I talked. I don't really stylistically know what I'm getting from a guy like Uriah Hall or what the fight's going to look like. I'm fascinated. But there's also a potential they just lead, potential they just lead on each other, and I get less than 50 points from both fighters. Yeah. Um, so you fade a fight, you kind of fade a fight like that. Um, I, I think certainly. It'll be very intriguing that we have two title fights with very, very live underdogs. Um, so that should absolutely uh, uh, play to the interest of this card as well. Um, I'm very fascinated by the FanDuel scoring system. I think that um, they covered pretty much any statistics or basis that you could have in an MMA fight. So you're, you're not really beholden to one type of style you can get points with a submission artist you can also get points with a, a striker on their feet as well so uh i'm very very intrigued to see how it's going to go um and i'm very excited to see some real life human sports again that's for sure i am as well it'll be great like having the wnba and the nfl draft is fun I, i've enjoyed the discourse around Absolutely. those however actual sports which involves actual stuff happening i am very much pumped for and it will be a whole lot of fun that is austin swaim make sure you find him on twitter at a swaim three his helper for this card will be up i believe you said thursday right Absolutely. Yeah, I got one more thing. I, I'm a born and born and raised Denver native. Very excited. We were the 14th state to oh. to legalize sports betting here and open up FanDuel Sportsbook and a lot of things like that. So very proud of my state legislatures and uh, <laughs> happy very day. happy about that development. <laughs> Absolutely. Very happy day. It's a good time to be Austin Sway, that's for sure. Oh, uh, man. And you just get this perfectly with like UFC and NASCAR, and NASCAR. coming back. Absolutely. Uh, I might need to visit. Uh, mm -hmm. with proper social distancing <laughs> being taken into account as well. That's so make sure right. you follow Austin on Twitter at aswaym 3 Again, doing NASCAR, UFC, and NBA over at numberfire.com. I am Jim Sonnes. You can find me on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. Big thank you to Calvin Theobald, our video producer, for running the video side of things here today. Thank you, Cal, as always. And thank you to everyone for tuning in. Hopefully you can enjoy this UFC card because there are a, hot, a lot more coming up. We'll have NASCAR podcasts next week. Pump for that. It's going to be a whole lot of fun. We'll talk to you then. This has been Heat Check Fantasy Podcast powered by Number Fire.